Welcome to the Monty panel at uh, Entercom's well-known oil and gas conference. Uh, thank you very much for joining us to hear about a play that is very near and dear to us, certainly to everybody that works in the patch and the oil patch and everybody on this panel today. Uh, you know, thank you to Entercom for giving us the platform to talk about what we think is one of the most competitive plays in North America. And honestly, that's whether you're looking at natural gas exposure or liquids exposure or condensate exposure, we think this is a play that you absolutely have to take seriously and look at. I'll make the introductions in a bit, but my name is Joan Jura, and I'm a research analyst for T Securities uh, based out of Calgary. And you'll hear most panelists refer to me as JJ. Uh, and with me today, we've got uh, some of the foremost experts in the Montney. So I'll introduce them alphabetically. We've got from Advantage Oil and Gas, we've got the CEO Andy Ma. From New Vista is Chief Operating Officer Mike Lawford, Paul Wanklin, President and CEO of Pipestone Energy. And then we've got Marty Proctor, President and CEO of Seven Generations Energy. Each of these companies is a pure play Montney producer, and they have shown tremendous uh, success to date on their respective asset base. So the purpose of today's session really is to introduce you to the Montney. It's to talk about all its strengths, and what I hope uh, as a conclusion is that you'll leave this session convinced that not only is it a play that you gotta look at, but you should invest in. And there's many, many reasons to talk about it, and we'll address all those issues, uh, all those things uh, in due course. We will keep our comments uh, to the play level. Uh, you'll be able to hear a lot more on specific company information in the individual sessions later on this week. So. On the money, like why look at the money? Uh, we like to say that it's really big, it's really thick, and there's a lot of it. It spans 50,000 square miles geographically, and in certain parts, it can be up to 1,000 feet thick. There was a study uh, prepared by the NEB several years ago, which is the Energy Board here in Canada, that estimates there's 449 TCF of recoverable gas in the money across Alberta and BC. Uh, 14.5 billion barrels of NGLs, 1.1 billion barrels of recoverable oil. So it's a massive, massive play. And if you actually look at it in the context of total Canadian production, the Montney right now accounts for half of gas production in Western Canada. And obviously we think this market share is just gonna to continue to climb as uh, Montney production, because of its economics, uh, will eventually replace a lot of the non montney production. Like I said, it's driven by robust economics, the size and the extent of the play is extremely large, as I've already hinted at. And quite honestly, we think, and I'll give you some numbers to this, to this extent, that at current prices, we think it competes extremely well with the best plays out there. And you know, I know most people like to focus on the Permian and the Marcellus as, as comparable North American plays, but I'll give you some numbers to show that we think the Montney is actually more competitive than those plays. So for example, and I, I apologize, I'm gonna, you know, rattle off a few numbers here without a presentation, but as you can imagine, we've got about 14 type curves across the entire money. You know, whether it's condensate rich money, gas weighted money, if we take, we think those are 14 very representative uh, type curves. If you average on strip today, if you average the average IRR of these plays, we come up with 40% average IRR, which I think is very attractive in today's environment. Average payout is about two years. Now, obviously we, we prefer to use a more constructive pricing environment for oil and gas, but just you know, for numbers' sake, let's say we, you know, we go to sixty dollar WTI and three dollar NYMEX, for example, which I thought I don't think are unreasonable at all. You know, that IRR jumps to one hundred and thirty percent, so from forty percent to one hundred thirty percent, and the average well pays out in one year. So let's, you know, how does that compare to, for example, the Delaware and Midland basins, where we also have a huge database of type curves uh, to compare? And on strip today, we're seeing IRRs eighteen to twenty percent on average across the entire, all the benches uh, in each of the Delaware and the, and the Midland and payouts closer to four years. And, you know, in a $60 world, obviously it's better, but we still see IRRs in the 45%. So clearly, you know, it is our view that the Montney is more economic today uh, than some of those other plays. And I can run the same things on the Marcellus as well. And, and just for, you know, just to put some numbers to it, you know, Marcellus uh, current strip, we're seeing IRRs of 17% going to 44% if you use the $3 NYMEX case and clearly payouts are a little bit higher than, than what I mentioned in, in the Montney. So clearly, you know, we think the economics are very, very competitive. Uh, we think it's actually quite impressive in today's environment. 
uh, especially you know all the capital cost reductions that we've seen, all the operating cost reductions that we've seen, and all the challenges and headwinds that a lot of these producers have had to uh, overcome, and many of which have overcome. Them. The thing with the money that I really, you know, I really want to emphasize today, and hopefully you're here from from our panel members, is one we think the reserves are much more conservatively booked in the money when compared to some of our peers. Uh, in the U.S., and two, we think there's more upside to inventory levels in the Montney uh, than than you would um, than we could see, for example, either in the Permian or the Marcellus. Last point I'll leave you with today, uh, before handing it over, is uh, you know on valuations and leverage. I mean, you know, you look at the average Montney producer today that at least you know our shop follows trades at 4.2 times next year's cash flow, and you know. You look at the Permian, it's closer to 5.9 times, and the Marcellus is 6.3 times. So, you know, not only do you think there's an opportunity to own a fantastic asset uh, with a fantastic set of operators, but you can get it at two turns cheaper. And generally speaking, our, you know, our producers um, have lower leverage uh, than, than our U.S. peers, simply because, we, you know, we've had to deal with pricing issues for a lot longer uh, than, than most U.S. producers. So that's kind of all I had for my introduction. Uh, hopefully that gives you a flavor for what we're looking at here. Uh, what I'll do next before we jump, in, jump into the Q&A is I'll have uh, each company representative provide a two or three minute uh, introduction to their company and their assets, and then we'll jump into Q&A. So with that, maybe I'll, maybe Andy, I'll have you start uh, with the advantage. Great. Thank you very much, uh, JJ. And I wanted to thank, uh, Intercom and everybody else here for participating and listening in today. That's uh, fantastic. And, you know, just talk a little bit about Advantage. We're a 45,000 BOA day uh, company here in Canada. We started drilling the Montney in 2008. We're primarily on more of the lean gas areas uh, of our asset base. And over time, we've extended uh, just east into our three other assets, of which we have a total of 210 net sections. The other assets tend to be more liquids driven. So we've, uh, you know, condensate to light oils and uh, we're building that today. We're approximately 10% liquids and going to be continuing to increase that over time here. I think the, um, the big factor that we have is, you know, we're one of the lowest cost producers uh, in the Montney. We uh, own and control our infrastructure. And in that, you know, we have a 400 million a day gas plant at our foundational asset, which is, uh, not full today and we've just finished some initial infrastructure into our liquids areas which will facilitate some growth here into the future you know our plan would be to continue to delineate and uh, add more liquids and gas as we see the product prices here uh, maneuver in the next while and we sit at a strong balance sheet as jj said we're at 2.1 times annualized debt to cash flow today and uh, much less than 10% of our growing inventory and land base we've actually even touched. So I think I'd like to characterize, uh, you know, I guess our evolution along this play has been very measured growth, learned a lot, just like most of the peers that you'll hear from. And uh, we're not in a, a growth mode that uh, allows us to not learn from other basins. And I think that application of technology is certainly a big benefit to the Monty players. Thanks. Uh, Mike, uh, tell us a little bit about New Vista, please. All right, unmute. Thanks, JJ. And uh, yeah, I'd like to um, get on the back of Andy's comments there. Thanks to Entercom for having us to the conference. Um, it's a, a little bit easier to do it this year, not uh, without the travel. Um, it's always nice to get together and see see people face to face, but uh, very efficient for us to be able to do this in uh, in kind of half a day's time. So. Uh, yeah, so about New Vista, we're um, uh, similar to Andy, we're about 50,000 uh, BOE uh, per day of production today. Um, our production mix is roughly about 30% condensate, 65% uh, um, gas and 5% NGLs. Um, large portion of our revenue driven by the condensate um, portion of our volumes um, in a normalized uh, commodity price environment, about 60% of our revenue does come from the condensate barrel. Uh, our assets, as far as their geographic location, basically straddle uh, the gap between the southern end of uh, Advantage's assets in the Wembley area and the northern um, uh, end of the seven generations assets. And we're 
nestled up right against just to the west of uh, Pipestone. So you guys have done a great job of um, geographically selecting a good mix of companies. Um, you can think of Nuvista as um, our company is largely being comprised of two entities. Um, our first, the first entity being the Wapiti assets, uh, which form about two thirds of our current production. Um, they really are the free cash engine uh, that'll fund the growth of our Pipestone uh, development, which is the second entity. Our Pipestone assets are roughly about a third of our current production and will form the backbone of our growth uh, model going forward. Um, all of the plumbing and market access is in place to grow our assets at a rate of about 10% per year for through the next four years. Um, through a combination, we have uh, a mix of owned infrastructure and then midstream um, arrangements that are put in place. Uh, the assets themselves are set up to produce between 70 and 90,000 uh, BOE per day uh, optimally. Um, all of the cash costs, whether it's our OPEX, our transportation, GNA, are all optimally designed for that production range um, between 70 and 90. And hopefully the, the Q&A will get into a little bit more of the, you know, the free cash flow generating ability and the returns associated with that profile. Uh, we've managed our production, as we talked about uh, prior to the, to the uh, video conference here, um, managed our production profile to a flat 50,000 BOE per day came into the crisis with uh, 15 new new wells coming on production. So we're capable of about 60 today and we'll manage that flat at 50 into the beginning of 2021. And in 2021, we've carried in 14 drilled and completed wells, which will complete first thing next year. And that'll form about 60% of the stay flat production required to offset our, our decline. That flat profile that we've gone through with this year um, is setting us up for a base decline that'll be around 30% next year. So our, we talk about our, our def defense plan is uh, quite robust with a stay flat capital in the $130 million range. And, you know, keep the sports analogy going, we're set up with a, a, what we consider a very explosive offense in the environment where commodity prices, uh, you know, stabilize at a little bit higher than today's level. So that would be uh, New Vista in a nutshell. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Paul, can I uh, have you talk to us about Pipestone, please? You bet, JJ. Thanks uh, for having us again, JJ and the Intercom guys. Uh, we're a relatively new entry to the to the game. Um, it was uh, Pipestone Energy was formed just over a year and a half ago, uh, merging with uh, with Blackbird Energy to form about 140 section contiguous block in the Pipestone area just outside Grand Prairie, uh, tucked in as as uh, Mike says in between um, a bunch of the, all the rest of the panelists here. Uh, the, the block is located in the you know most liquids rich portion of the trend, uh, as are uh, many of the assets you've just heard about. Um, when we when we merged about a year ago today, well exactly a year ago today, we were producing about 1,500 BOEs a day. Uh, we just uh, went through Q2 uh, release. We're about 17,000 BOEs a day today of production. Uh, our mix is uh, close to 45% total liquids. About a third of our of our total liquids, or third of our production, is is condensate. Um, we've added 27 new wells uh, on three pads to get to to this point, and we built out our infrastructure about a year ago to uh, to build out phase one of our of our business plan, which is uh, getting to about 35,000 BOEs a day. Um, we've uh, we actually are taking a bit of a different stance. Um, we've driven our cost structure down significantly. Uh, in the past 18 months to where when we when we look at um, uh, normalizing our uh, our frac costs on a per ton basis we think we're we're you know tied with you know basically the leading cost operators in the Monty play today so coupled with uh, the high quality of the assets we have uh, the infrastructures built um, we just uh, we just announced a financing with our two largest u.s shareholders uh, in fact, um, GMT Capital and Riverstone, and we're going to raise seventy million dollars on a preferred, a convertible preferred basis at a pretty significant um, uh, uh, increase in over our uh, over our current trading price, and that's going to allow us to kickstart our, our development plan again. So we're uh, we're going to get pretty aggressive. Um, we think we can generate really strong returns in that mid forty dollar range, and and that's our current plan going forward. So we're going to take our 17,000 BOEs a day today and grow it, basically double it in the next two years to uh, mid 35,000 BOEs per day uh, in 2022. 
And at that point, um, our company, we believe, is in that uh, full um, cash, free cash flow uh, generation mode where we can generate something in the order of $75 million at, uh, at the prevailing strip price um, after maintenance capital after 22. So we're, we're all set. We're financed really to, to execute that growth plan. And that's where we think we need to be to catch up to the you know, other players on the panel to, to have a sustainable business model. Cause at, you know, 17, 18,000 uh, certainly is not in the Monty play, but at, you know, 35 to, you know, as much as a hundred, I think it's a different, uh, it's a different uh, story. So we're excited to get going on this plan and um, got great, great support from our board and our key shareholders. So that's, uh, that's pretty much a nutshell where, where we're at. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Marty, you want to walk us through seven gens? Sure. Thank you, JJ. And thanks, Entercom, for hosting this Montney panel. I really appreciate the opportunity to hear from uh, other great Montney producers as well. Uh, we're uh, at Seven Generations. We're a top 10 producer in Canada by total BOE per day, and we're a top five gas producer. We're actually the largest condensate producer in Canada. Our product mix is about 42% gas and about 58% liquids. We've specialized in Montney development and we're focused on the liquids rich win window of the Montney, which is south of Grand Prairie, uh, where we hold about 800 sections or about 500,000 net acres of Montney rights. We grew rapidly from less than 8,000 BOE per day in 2013 to about 200,000 BOE per day in 2018 and 19. That phenomenal growth gave us critical capacity and capital markets relevancy, but wasn't sustainable forever. So beginning in 2018, we converted our strategy from volumes growth to free cash flow growth. We worked very hard to understand our rock. Our geoscientists worked with our reservoir engineers to delineate additional resource and improve our type curves. We did all the fundamental science needed to evolve our drilling and completions techniques so we could deliver top wells and minimize parent-child interactions. So while commodity prices haven't cooperated recently, every other attribute of our business, everything we can control has gone well. Costs have improved, decline rates are getting better, and we've been generating meaningful free cash flow for the last year and a half. That was about $160 million of free cash flow in 2019 and about $80 million in the first half of this year. We've actually adjusted our 2020 budget twice. So our capital has come down to now $650 million, which is about half of our 2019 program. And our production forecast this year is now about 180,000 BUE per day at the midpoint of the guidance. And as I say, I think uh, we expect to generate free cash flow this year, uh, even with this reduced commodity price outlook. And as declines moderate, costs improve, we think we can sustain that production level for about 650 to $700 million uh, for the foreseeable future. Thanks, JJ. All right, thanks guys. Hopefully that gave everybody a flavor of uh, some of the uh, some of the concepts that will be covered uh, over the next couple of days in the company specific sessions. Uh, what I thought I'd do for the remainder, uh, call it the next 40, 45 minutes, is really go through some of the macro themes that we think uh, need to be understood by investors as they look at investing in the money. So with that, maybe Marty, we'll start with you given that you just reminded us that you're the largest condensate producer uh, in Canada. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the condensate market specifically, uh, maybe cover some of the supply demand fundamentals and, and how you see that market evolving uh, over the coming, call it a few years. Sure, thanks JJ. Uh, the, the demand for condensate in Canada is about 700,000 barrels per day. And nearly all of that demand comes from the oil sands region, which use condensate for blending to dilute their bitumen into a blended product that flows in pipelines. Canadian condensate supply, though, is only about 420,000 barrels per day. So the basin is very short of condensate. The balance of that demand, about 280,000 barrels per day, is imported. The Koshin and Southern Lights pipelines import condensate, and uh, they have capacity in total of about 280,000 barrels per day. So we're running very, very close to maximum imports. And this has typically made condensate pricing very, very well correlated to WTI. In Mount Bellevue, the condensate trades at a slight discount to WTI, but transportation costs of about $8 a barrel to get that, that marginal condensate barrel into Canada 
helps to set the clearing price here in Canada uh, to be usually on par with WTI. So if demand increases much more, it's likely that rail will, rail will also become the marginal price setting mechanism for condensate, which could uh, further improve local pricing. So I think this gives Montney players the potential to win both from higher WTI and also from improving condensate differentials. There are, there are a lot of levers to deal with local supply demand shocks. Uh, with the COVID and the OPEC events, we saw local differentials expanding to a discount of about $15 for condensate uh, in May, really just for the one month. And then everything normalized again for June deliveries with differentials close to about $2. So the import pipes tend to respond very quickly uh, with about a month lag. And as I say, they become the marginal barrel. We saw, had, we saw some producers ease off on production uh, during that uh, May period uh, or even store barrels. In fact, we did both. We actually chose to defer the startup of some of our new wells into better pricing. And we actually stored a few barrels uh, from Q2 into Q3. Uh, and note, we can also sell condensate into light oil streams if pricing for, for condensate as a diluent uh, becomes, uh, if the differential becomes too wide. And that demand for light oil is very resilient. So, uh, you know, oil sands projects are very capital intensive, but once they're running, they're, they're very low cost projects that will probably deliver steady volumes for a long time and therefore require a steady supply of condensate. So ultimately the condensate market in Canada is functioning very well. Uh, and structural pricing similar to WTI is solid. Currently, we're pricing condensate about two dollars uh, at about a two dollar discount to WTI. Over time, I think condensate demand and prices could meaningfully expand, especially if the export pipelines move ahead, like the Trans Mountain expansion, or the Enbridge Line Three reversal, or even the Keystone X XL pipeline. Thanks, Marty. Um, it's definitely very informative. Uh, you know, in, in a similar vein. Maybe advantage, uh, Andy, I'll have you talk a little bit about similar fundamentals from a natural gas basis. I mean, certainly ACO has been quite strong relative to its NYMEX counterpart. Um, as the most gas-weighted producer uh, that we have on the panel today, can you give us a flavor for supply demand, uh, how things have evolved over the last couple of years and from a pricing perspective and where you see that going? Yeah, for sure, JJ. The um you know, we've seen the Canadian natural gas market here, specifically, let's call it ACO pricing, uh, move up uh, significantly over the last 10 months. And, you know, with and also much less volatility than we've seen. I think a lot of the U.S. investors and people that don't follow the sector as closely here recently, you know, saw the Canadian side of the business on the natural gas as being, you know, if you look back over the last few years, uh, it was very volatile in pricing. The ACO prices, we hit negatives up to $2, back to negative. And that would occur over the course of even two to three weeks. Uh, there was a lot of talk uh, as that progressed uh, and occurred that, you know, that Canada have enough capacity to move natural gas, uh, both from BC through Alberta and then all out to uh, US or exports there. And there was a lot of concern that that egress was not going to uh, materialize. Well, there was two things. One, we were doing it to ourselves. I think uh, the big system that moves a lot of the gas through Alberta, the Nova gas transmission system, you know, had it, would, it did get a little tighter on physical aspects as uh, supply grew quickly over the last uh, three years. But what was not, not understood was also that uh, NGTL or the natural Nova gas transmission line had plans to expand the system by over three BCF, of which we were, we are almost a year and a half through that now. So there's been significant additions there. And as uh, gas supply from Western Canada has uh, flattened, and I think it flattened to maybe slightly negative here as uh, most producers have pulled back on growth capital, uh, we're gonna see a situation where we're gonna be back in a very good situation with the uh, takeaway capacity and the capacity to move gas to markets. In addition to that, um, a lot of that gas from Alberta moves on what we call the main line and main line tolls have been reduced here by TransCanada who owns that uh, or TC Energy today. And that uh, is also making it much more competitive with uh, US gas. So physically we don't see issues here. These, this has become uh, better and better and I think it'll even get better. The other factor was a operational uh, procedure that was instituted by uh, Nova Gas. And uh, what they did there was cause 
in itself, what we believe anyway, additional volatility in the system. And that has been resolved. And I think that in the last 10 months is a reflective that, you know, it's, uh, prices have tightened up to uh, somewhere around $2. And we're even seeing summer eco here pricing near $2 right now. It is going to be fluctuating, uh, but as you look out to the 21 uh, period, you know, we're seeing differentials to Henry up close in, you know, today it's as tight as 35 cents. I think it'll come back to somewhere more historical, 60 to 85 cents um, versus Henry Hub. And with that, that's pretty good pricing for uh, Canadian producers. It pushes us into, you know, a low to mid twos to even high twos. And I think that's going to be a business that's uh, sustainable for a lot of the producers uh, in the Montney. Uh, so the outlook is, it, you know, are we structurally uh, in a bullish situation yet? No, but I think it's been so much better than it has. And I think it warrants a second look for some uh, investors and others that have not, that have maybe broke Canada off and said, you know, it is it's just not working up there while well, it is working. So that would be some comments on that end. Maybe as a quick follow on, uh, do you see any risk as the Montney continues to displace non montney gas volumes uh, just because the, the production comes from different regions of uh, the basin? Do you see future risk of infrastructure bottlenecks or you know, a return to some of the volatility that we saw, I guess, in 1819? Summer, yeah. summer of 1819 really what yeah, I'm I think it's going to be much more uh, smooth uh, going forward, JJ. I don't see the amount of rapid growth with some a lot of the companies on the gas supply side. And I also believe that we're getting ahead of it in terms of the pipeline buildouts. So that is pacing much better than uh, what it was because things, as, as always, uh, it gets congested when there's a bit of a bullish run and uh, people drill heavily, which occurred somewhat in the Montney, not to any degree like the U.S. basins. Uh, and that caught up with a little bit with the uh, takeaway. So that, I think, is going to be uh, uh, well, well into, you know, smoothing out the ability to supply demand. And then secondly, we're seeing also continuing increasing demand just in uh, Alberta, for instance, for power uh, conversions and so on. So that in itself is also occurring. So I guess if I could summarize the last two comments, both from you, Marty, and you, Andy, is that, you know, we're still very constructive from condensate and a liquids perspective, as well as a gas perspective. Uh, the demand uh, for both products is still in high demand and it's becoming more and more competitive over time. So maybe the, the takeaway I'd have for everybody that's uh, listening or, or looking at uh, watching this, uh, Watching this panel is that uh, you know we're still very constructive, and the Montney is going to be a survivor uh, at the end of all of this, and we'll remain very very competitive with the other assets. I thought I'd switch gears a little bit, um, and maybe over to you, Mike. Um, could you touch a little bit on environmental standards? And, and I know ESG has become very very top for the last few years. Investors are demanding ESG, but you know what's you know, what are some of the things that Canadian oil and gas companies are doing mm -hmm. that to a certain extent is underappreciated, especially when compared to uh, other non-Canadian producers? Like, what are some of the things that we do really, really well uh, that you can highlight progress that we've made relative to the United States uh, plays or even global, uh, if you can, Mike? Yeah, for sure. For sure, JJ. It's uh, this definitely could be a panel in itself, this topic. I think we would <laughs> we'd all agree the amount of attention it gets. And, you know, I think, we, you know, we all know deep down that, you know, we are all doing the right things. And a lot of this has just been about communication. And uh, so, you know, we pull out a few stats like Mac Van Willigan uh, put out a piece of right about around a year ago now that did a great job of, you know, advocating for Canadian energy and especially on the ESG side. And so we quote a number of topics and number of points out of his work. And, you know, Canada does score as the, you know, the third ranked um, country in the world as far as ESG, uh, second to Norway and Denmark, who are obviously not major oil producing regions. Um, but when you consider that Canada represents, you know, I think the fifth largest concentration of global oil res or global reserves, um, it just shows how important it is for us to have that ESG scorecard um, ranked so high. So, you know, there's probably, you know, three points that we like to point out, like firstly on the oil sands, that's where the biggest spotlight is. Um, you know, oil sands emissions intensity is down almost 30% over the last 20 years and forecast to be down an additional 10% by 2030. And, um, you know, when you think of the new projects that are coming on now, they're coming in with intensities lower than the average US refined barrel. 
So, you know, that's, you know, one thing you'll kind of see some stones thrown across the fence with respect to oil sands growth and uh, uh, relative to the U.S. And, you know, that's, you know, a point that we think is important to make, uh, make clear. Um, you know, secondly, LNG is a big part of um, our emission story and, uh, you know, LNG Canada coming on stream is going to have the, you know, the same effect or the effect on uh, reducing global emissions by 60 to 90 megatons and uh, through the displacement of Chinese coal production. And that's the equivalent of taking out about 80% of the vehicles on the road in Canada. And those are the types of things Canada is doing um, on a global, on a global platform. You asked about comparing to the U.S., and that's a bit of a tricky one because, you know, we like to say that, you know, we're all in this together. Energy producers in North America need to attract investment. And, you know, we see the things that um, are going on in the Permian, the largest Permian producer, bringing their flaring down to 3% from, you know, very high numbers previously. Um, you know, I look back at some data um, in the Bakken, and, you know, there was a time when they were reducing flare, the percent of the amount of gas produced flared from 35% down to 10%. And, you know, over that period in Canada, we were reducing, or well, we were flat actually at 3% per year, um, through those years. So there, there is progress being made, but we've, you know, I think we've got there a lot earlier than a lot of the uh, US production. Um, and I guess the point we try to make, this is a, some data from Stanford, is that if, if the rest of the world took on Canada's approach to flaring and venting standards, um, the GHGs emitted from producing a barrel of oil would drop by 23%. And so, you know, that's that's kind of the you know the, the headlines that we like to quote um, as far as our um, as uh, as far as what Canada has achieved. Um, always like to put a plug in on that for you know Nuvista in this regard. Um, our emissions um, at 0 0.03 uh, tons of CO2 per VOE is about roughly half the North American uh, benchmark. Um, we've dropped that down from 35% uh, since uh, 2012. And we're continuing to make a lot of progress on that front. It's really, you know, it's tricky when your numbers are already pretty low um, to keep chipping them down. But, you know, in, installing waste heat recovery units on our compressors um, has been a has been a big uh, um, achievement for us and continue to push other projects. Methane um, venting is obviously a big one. It's 28 uh, times stronger of a GHG, GHG than CO2. Um, given that New Vista's gas is sour, it's actually one of the advantages of being sour. Everything in our facilities is Loctite, not a, not a stitch of gas is vented. So, you know, we've, we actually have a pathway to zero methane emissions that we've uh, laid out internally. So water is probably the other one to focus on. You know, if we have more time, water could be another 10 or 15 minute discussion on what we're doing um, as an industry with respect to water. But uh, probably turn it back to you to, uh, to move on. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. I mean, clearly, uh, I think one thing we have to emphasize is that uh, not only is this a world-class resource, but, you know, the standards are, you know, I'd say second to none, quite honestly. And, and Mike, some of those stats that you just shared with us uh, certainly prove that. Paul, uh, I want to talk a little bit, uh, uh, ask you a specific question, just because, you know, you're, as you mentioned in your introductory remarks, uh, you're a bit more of a growth-focused uh, company than, than the other peers on this panel. <laughs> But you know, one of the challenges, obviously, that we've seen, and, and we've seen these challenges in the U.S. as well, is access to capital. Really, has been a big challenge uh, for the sector over the last few years, at least. Um, in your view, and, and having just raised seventy million dollars, so congrats on that. Uh, in your view, you know, what do we need to show? Uh, what What's the value proposition that we need to prove uh, to attract new capital and new investors to the space? That's a tricky one, JJ, but um, I mean, there's some, some real societal headwinds facing the industry in total, and I certainly won't get into those, but, um, you know, funds coming out and saying we'll never invest, we can't invest in oil and gas, and uh, companies, uh, large companies saying that uh, they're going to reduce their, even though their major is reducing their production over the next 15 years or so by 40%. So, so there's reasons uh, you shouldn't invest. I think the Montney play and, and the four companies represented here today represent exactly why this is an investable uh, proposition. You know, one of the things we've, we've in Canada have, I think had an advantage uh, to some degree is that we haven't been as active on a, you know, per company or, or, or virtually, you know, we can compare the Permian versus the Montney play in general, haven't been as active in the development scene because we, have had a lack of access to capital. So companies, uh, I mean, Seven Gens has grown you know, explosively in its career, but, but most companies have, have had 
really taken a, a slower, you know, steadier view. That's that's enabled us to actually learn a lot of lessons that were hard fought lessons from, you know, our southern peers in terms of overcapitalizing plays, um, drilling too many benches at once, uh, too tight a spacing, and ultimately destroying a lot of capital. Uh, you know, it's it. I don't have the the number in front of me, but the the um, hundreds of billions that have been destroyed in the last five years because we've been overcapitalizing plays. I think is is the root of the problem, um, and that's going to and, and that problem I believe in Canada is being solved by the top money producers because they're they're going at a pace they're they're they're, they're selecting assets that are the most high quality will deliver the best returns and actually start you know, and uh, delivering corporate returns on capital employed. You know, that's critical to our business plan. Uh, we are targeting to be, you know, a top decile um, leader in that, in that regard. And I think we we see visibility getting there. So um, prudently spending capital, I think is the cornerstone of, of um, you know, managing your, your business. And, and I think that is going to lead investors to come back to this space in Canada um, and pay attention again, as you mentioned in your in your opening remarks. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And that's actually a pretty good segue into uh, another question that I have for the group. Uh, and maybe Marty, I'll start with you, and, and we'll move on uh, to everybody else. But you know, we talked a lot about reserves and inventory and parent-child issues, and you just reminded us, Paul, uh, how some of those issues how they've unfolded in the last few years. Uh, going back to your specific assets. Uh, and again, Marty, we'll start with you. Uh, how much inventory would you say you have relative to uh, your current development plans? Let's say in a normalized environment, let's say 2021 strip, you know, how much have you developed and how much is left? And the reason I'm asking is I want to provide a pretty sensitive scale uh, that each of these companies offers relative to their current, current size. Sure. That's a great question, JJ. And you know, we would we have about uh, 1,300 up all, upper and middle Montney locations in our core area, an area that we call the nest. And just those upper and middle locations in our core, uh, those 1,300 locations are about 20 years of inventory life. Uh, and as we consider the addition of the lower Montney in our development plans, we can likely add um, many more years, uh, ultimately perhaps uh, even a decade or, or more. So we have, and we also have plenty of uh, inventory and development regions outside of that core, which again could potentially add another decade or more of inventory. You know, for us, our reserves bookings are actually capped at a kind of a 10 year development program under, under the NI 51 101 rules. So that sets an upper limit on what we can book. Uh, our full field development, development plans, of course, are much longer than that. And, uh, but I can, I can relate our inventory count to our 2P reserves, for example, and our 2P reserves are about 1.6 billion barrels equivalent. Take that over 200,000 barrels equivalent per day that we produced last year, and that, that again is, is about 22 years of reserve life. Uh, and that, those 2P reserves only include about two thirds of our upper middle Montney in the nest. And so if you added the rest of the upper middle mountain, you've, you've added another decade. And as I said, we've got lower mountain plus expanding areas outside. So all those things combined, I mean, we've got multi years of running room uh, for inventory, uh, many, many decades, uh, certainly beyond my lifespan. And, you know, maybe as a quick follow on to that, uh, uh, you know, how should we think about any potential downside to parent child issues? I mean, in the U.S., we've seen several years of negative revisions due to spacing assumptions and parent-child interaction and, and and that sort of thing. And obviously, it's very topical. Uh, what kind of confidence? And I'll ask every everybody on the panel the same question. You know, what kind of confidence can you provide to uh, investors that that's not an issue uh, with Seven Gens Reserves? Well, it, it's certainly an issue for all of us and something that you have to be cognizant of. Uh, we we probably learned uh, the hard way, I would say, probably in 2017. Uh, that was when we were growing very, very quickly, and uh, we struggled with parent-child interactions as well as a few other things. But uh, it's something we're familiar with, and I would say it became a problem for many North American shale producers, maybe beginning in 2018, uh, we're somewhat unique, I would say, in the Montney and uh, maybe in other areas too. We're one of one of only a few operators with really large-scale development. We've got nearly 600 wells to date, 
So when what we what we found is that we've we've had to refine our completion techniques. It has to be very specific both to geology and geography, by which I mean proximity to existing wells. And so we did a lot of uh, rigorous science and geotechnical work to quantify, uh, reduce, and actually plan for the potential for parent-child interactions. So we actively plan for it today. It's been captured in our reserve bookings. I would say as well, the consistency of our ability to achieve our corporate guidance reflects this improvement in our business. We've had now at least uh, eight consecutive quarters of meeting or exceeding market expectations since we really got a handle on this issue a couple of years ago. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Marty. Uh, Andy, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, and as a reminder, you know, what's the size of the prize relative to advantage? And, you know, as a follow on, what, uh, uh, how, do you, how are you managing the negative, potential negative implication of parent child issues in, on your asset base specifically? Over to you, Andy. Yep, sure. Thanks, JJ. Um, so just to give you a perspective there, you know, of our 210 next sections of uh, land that we have to work with, located in four different contiguous packages. We would estimate today at the strip over 1,500, you know, the high-end locations that work at that kind of pricing. And of that, we only have uh, just over 300 booked. So lots of uh, running room yet. And as we continue to drill out some of the areas that uh, are new, uh, we're going to continue to add to that high-quality inventory. So, you know, in terms of putting some numbers to uh, to that for how long that would last us, you know, at our pace here at 45,000 BOE a day and even a little higher, we're probably looking at 15 to 20 wells a year to stay flat. And that depends on the mix of liquids wells versus uh, gas wells. So heck of a large inventory that uh, we would have similar to Marty. And over time, I guess when you talk about parent and child, we've, you know, we've always had a pretty measured growth pace. And uh, so at the most dense drill uh, in any of the sections, we've got four wells. And uh, you know, that's not in every layer of the modern. So we have up to uh, potentially five layers in some areas. And uh, we would space those out 50 meters uh, vertically. So 400 meters horizontally, 50 meters vertically. And uh, we've, we were ones that, you know, you could call us maybe a little slower on increasing the uh, frac intensity, but you know, we've just in the last uh, probably 12 months uh, pushed towards two to two and a half tons per meter in some of the fracks. And that that's only in more of our liquid areas in our gas areas, uh, which are very prolific. We're more averaging one ton, but the rock was that much better too. So that kind of allowed us to kind of work with that. So we've, have we seen some parent child? We've only seen it mostly on pressure responses, you know, and I think that's, um, there's nothing that's been detrimental uh, because of the density we've drilled at. And two, in our liquids areas, we haven't, we haven't gone to the point where we've been drilling the large pads uh, in any configuration that would allow a lot of cross uh, influence on that perspective. But I think things that we see from the Canadian producers and, you know, even uh, with seven gens and other U U.S. producers, you know, we all learn a lot from it, but we're, I think the Canadian producers are tend to throttle back quicker. You know, when we kind of see things that might not be working, we don't tend to hit it with a bigger hammer. We tend to say, let's just retrace here a little bit, think about this and try to figure it out. And I think the experiences of um, largely the U.S. basins are coming to our benefit in that, you know, we can see they're still, uh, you know, months or years ahead of us in production history and some of those higher densely drilled, higher intensity fracked wells. And we can learn and implement that you know, I like to say that the Montney overall is still a pretty clean slate to start from. So I, I don't have a lot of concern that we're not going to do it right and do it in a way that more optimizes economic returns here in Canada. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Uh, Mike, uh, any, any comments specific to New Vista on this part? Yeah, a few things. I think it's a largely similar. Um, maybe just to give you a, like a little bit of a background on you know how we got to the um, you know the size and scale that we had originally set out when we did the acquisition of the Pipestone assets two years ago. Um, we had laid out a, a production growth profile of twenty plus percent per year um, to get production up to ninety thousand BOE per day and hold that flat um, for the length of the commitments we made on the infrastructure side. And, you know, that was based on oil at $60. We could do that while ma maintaining a, um, a debt to cash flow ratio of 1.5 times. And 
that that 90,000 was all based on our assessment of the inventory and of the assets themselves. And it wasn't a, you know, a number that the growth for the sake of growth. Um, so fast forward to today, you know, we've seen a big adjustment in the in obviously in the commodity price and and in the governor of what governs the growth. And now it's a spend within cash flow model. And so when you look down to um, you know really what underpins the inventory back, back then, our proof plus probable inventory was made up of about 400 locations. And at 40 wells per year, that would satisfy our our 20% growth profile. Um, to grow to 90. So when you moderate that growth profile to about half that, uh, drilling 20 wells per year going forward, you can look at that 400 locations either as a an inventory that's got reduced risk or a high graded inventory taking the top 200 of your locations. So you know we look like to think of that as a bit more of a, a conservative approach to talking about well counts. Um, the reality is on our total asset base, you know, we've got the, our contingent resource, which is basically the next step out from your proof plus probable inventory. That number gets up to 1165. So when you start looking at the total breadth of the total inventory, it does have the same size and scale, but we like to focus on the stuff that the evaluators have kind of, you know, um, identified as proof plus probable as being very low risk. So I guess your second part of that question is res with respect to parent child. Um, and I guess, you know, we uh, outline the fact that we've got two different, um, you know, components of our company, the Pipestone assets uh, north of the river and then the Wapiti assets. And I'll maybe address each of those separately. So in Pipestone, um, we've gone into that on day one, similar to um, Pipestone Energy and uh, Paul, Paul's description with uh, cube development on day one. So we've reduced any of the issues with older wells being impacted by newer wells by approaching it with a cube uh, a, a cube approach. Um, we've also taken the interpad spacing and moved that um, out about 25% further than what we were originally doing in the asset south of the river just to mitigate that risk. Um, when you're drilling fewer wells, there's more of an impact if you have any sort of um, parent-child interactions that you didn't count on. And uh, back to what Paul said, you know, we have been able to um, use the feedback loop to learn on spacing uh, similar, similarly to Marty. And I think, I guess, for companies that were growing at a smaller rate, the impacts maybe were smaller, but we had the same issues in 2019 where we tested too close. Um, in our Gold Creek development, for example, we um, took one developable horizon and started trying to develop it with, two, with, with actually as two separate benches. And we encountered um, interference in those wells and learned from it. And we didn't stumble as far as the um, quarterly results go. We built in enough risk for those wells um, as we piloted those spacing tests. And uh, so we've taken that into our 2020 plans and uh, had uh, very good success from those learnings. And um, I guess that's probably the, you know, the best way to describe our approach to it. It's just the feedback loop being a very important um, aspect of our planning. Thanks, Mike. Uh, over to you, Paul. Yeah, thanks, JJ. Um, just to maybe continue on um, the theme that, that Mike was going through. Um, yeah, so we started, our first production came on north of the river into the new facilities that uh, Karen Tidewater had built last uh, last fall. So we were literally virtually was no money production in, in our block north of the river, which is virtually all of our block. Um, so, so we were able to start cube development right away. We had a couple of, we had a number of strat tests that we, we were comfortable, uh, delineated the, the block to start with. And so, so, so a couple of things that we were able to try to, to focus on. And one is what is the, uh, what's, what's the proper number of benches to start with? And in the area in Pipestone, diff different operators, including New Vista and others have been targeting, you know, separately for four different benches of the 600 foot thick stack of, of, uh, of Monty rock in there. And, and so, you know, we started with the two bench model. We don't know if that's correct. So we don't know if three or four benches at once is the right answer yet. That's, that's to be determined. But one of the things we do believe strongly in is um, we, we've gone to a full XLE of uh, frac design and we have done a lot of downhole diagnostics to try to, find out how we can um, create the most conformance with our fracks. And, and if we can get 90% conformance and try to avoid those rogue fracks that you know, you've got to um, you know, uh, travel out half a mile or more, 
Um, that goes a long way to eliminating future parent-child issues. And again, as Mike said, you know, uh, spacing your your pads uh, appropriately, and and again, timing. Um, you know, developing a pad, offsetting an existing pad in a reasonably short time interval. You know, after startup, but the first pad is going to help a lot. So we're we're working hard on a lot of those issues. We're uh, we're scheduled to do some dip-in fiber testing. Um, of our production later this year um, that'll you know talk about the efficiency of our again of our of our frac design and I think all those go into a lot of the you know mitigating future parent child when you roll that into inventory we've really only scratched the surface on the westernmost part of our land so far in terms of developing um, the way we see it you know more or less around our existing facilities um, we've we can easily get to 50,000 BOEs a day and hold it flat for, you know, 10 years or more. So we've got a ton of land that's remains not fully evaluated yet because we just haven't got uh, infrastructure out there yet. So um, the answer really to inventory and, and sustainability is we've got lots. So that's probably the easiest way I think to, to address that for, for Pipestone. Yeah. Thanks everybody. So I think, uh, you know, one of the big conclusions that I understand from, from hearing everybody's commentary on this subject is that, generally speaking, we're pretty conservatively booked on reserves. So, you know, the chance of negative surprises or negative downside, whether to due to parent-child issues or spacing, et cetera, uh, are extremely low, uh, you know, according to you know, according to some of the commentary that we made. Uh, lots of inventory, certainly for every player. And that kind of leads me to the next question, which is, you know, the Canadian space has really learned uh, the hard way to moderate growth and focus on free cash and managing your decline rates and your maintenance capital just because access to capital has been challenged. Uh, U.S., you know, again, comparing it to the U.S., where that's really something that's uh, transitioned only lately, you know, historically, as, as a lot of you touched on. It's been a, you know, kind of a grow grow, 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 or drill, baby, drill type scenario, but investors are now starting to ask for returns, uh, focus on you know, maximizing free cash and implementation of dividends, et cetera. So I guess the question, the next question I have for, for, the, for the group here is that, uh, you know, the lack of growth or the lower relative growth that we've shown relative to our U.S. peers is really due to conservatism uh, of our allocation of capital as opposed to, you know, the availability of the resource. So the resource is there, but the real governor is not the resource. It's just how much count we, we wish to put at it. So the question now, long story short, the question, and Marty, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, defer to you on for, to be the first to answer this question is, how do you think about spending that free cash flow, uh, which you, you hinted at for the last couple of years? And two, you know, what do you need to see in order to return to a, more of a growth focused environment what the seven gens need to see yeah yeah great question and, and i would say look we we do what we think is the right thing for the business and and hope that uh, coincides with the investors expectations of us you know we we actually began the evolution from growth to more of a free cash flow generation model a couple of years ago I think before it was cool to do so, and we thought it was the right thing for our business at that time. We, we just felt that the sustain the growth that we had was not sustainable. We were very fortunate to have the great capital providers, uh, private equity in our early days, and then public markets when we, when we went public at the end of 2014. And at the time, of course, uh, investors were rewarding growth, so we had support from the capital markets. We did uh, we did pursue growth, um, learned a lot from it, and and I would say. And that that support from the from the capital providers really allowed us to achieve the size and scale that we have, and now we are the largest condensate producer. We're a top five gas producer. That does allow us to generate free cash flow, uh, as as you said, and as I said earlier, uh, free cash flow in 2019, free cash flow in the first half of this year, the the six quarters combined of something like 240 million dollars. So now. To your question, the allocation of that free cash flow now, um, we think the, the most prudent allocation is uh, for debt repayment. Um, we did begin buying back some stock uh, late in 2018 uh, and through part of 2019. 
uh, and our debt was comfortable by the end of last year. By the end of last year, we had a debt to cash flow on a trading 12-month basis of 1.4 times. So in that commodity price environment, it was okay. Where we are today, though, it's it's a little uncomfortable. So if, if commodity prices, if oil particularly stays oil, because that's uh, where our revenue uh, stream is based, being uh, largely condensate weighted, uh, if oil stays in the low to mid 50s, uh, our debt is is a little higher than we would like it to be. So our our first dollar of free cash flow will go to balance sheet, uh, therefore debt repayment. Um, you know, in time, uh, as you say, when will we resume growth? Uh, you know, I think ultimately we see in a couple of years as our decline rates have moderated down to the mid 30s, and our costs uh, I expect to be even better then. Uh, we will consider allocating free cash flow to both uh, debt repayments and um, and growth, uh, whether it's growth uh, of a dividend perhaps by that time or or modest amounts of growth in our absolute in our base production. Uh, those choices we might make in a couple of years, but for now, I think uh, what we really need to focus on is delivering the best we can, executing the best we can, and delivering free cash flow per share uh, that becomes meaningful for the shareholders. Thanks, Marty. Uh, Andy, where does uh, where does Advantage stand on this part? Yeah, so Advantage's uh, near-term strategy, as we've uh, saw, uh, seen this environment uh, unfold to us, is that you know some of the macro factors, especially the commodity price, uh, like I said, even though we believe uh, volatility would be less, it's still volatile. Um, and we don't necessarily all of us control that to a large degree. So, you know, where we've, Traditionally, we've said uh, in our views that that the cash flow for our size of company and our makeup, you know, should be in that two range. We're probably more looking at getting it down to one and a half or even better. And even at the strip here, with the benefit of, you know, our longer production history and uh, kind of low 23, 24% decline rate, uh, at the strip price today, we can generate enough to uh, pay down some more debt, uh, drive single digit growth. And with that, you know, continue on uh, looking forward that if there's more free cash, you know, we would at some point maybe consider something, like some kind of return on capital in that fashion. But I think the first for us is really debt repayment in the near term, followed by uh, investment, you know, measured investment into our asset, which generates strong returns, even at sub $2 gas and just over $40 oil because of our infrastructure that we control and own. So. That is where we would put it, and uh, if it continues that you know it's better than that in terms of free cash, then we would look that uh, we could return some cash at some day. Uh, but I think that's where we're headed, and um, you know we do think that most of the Canadian money players can uh, achieve the same. You know whether they're on a different time horizon of development, we can all get to that point because the money is the type of asset and the size of the asset and the quality that. Uh, can be very conducive to supporting that kind of a uh, uh, of a business model. Uh, Mike, uh, how's New Vista's views on the use of free cash, uh, and at what point or what do you need to see to uh, get back to a bit more of a growth uh, to the ninety thousand that you talked about earlier in your comments? Yeah, for sure, JJ. I think uh, you know Marty. It hit me when you uh, you mentioned that you know you're doing the right thing for corporation and not for, you know, what a particular shareholder might say, um, you hope they align. And, you know, we, we strongly agree with that. You know, the, we didn't build the company to, 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 to flatten out today. Um, you know, we built the infrastructure, we built the people, we built the midstream and downstream contracts in order to be a 70 to 90,000 barrel. And, you know, the, the reality is that the company is a lot more efficient at 90 than 70. Um, but we do have the flexibility to moderate that growth from, you know, today our productive capacity at 60,000, um, growing that another 10,000 and leveling it off definitely is um, in the cards for us. And, you know, part of this has all been about questions from investors on returns. And, you know, we, we, we not that we struggle with it, but we question a lot is, you know, is it about IRR? Is it about return on capital employed? Is it about return of capital? And it seems that, you know, the, um, every shareholder want that maybe sees that a bit differently. And at the end of the day, we, we've taken a step back and said, you know, the, a shareholder wants to see his or her investment worth more down the road than it is today. And we've tried to boil down, you know, the three components of what does that mean from our perspective? And 
we start with financial strength and this we talked a little bit about this in the intro that um you know financial strength for us in a defensive mode is at 40 dollars oil we have the liquidity to stay flat through 2021 um, without incurring any uh, material um, downstream or midstream uh, obligations but we're going to reduce our debt with 50 to 55 million dollars in free cash flow through the back half of the year and that's the first step that's what it's what we need to do for the corporation and that also happens to align with what investors want um, the second um, uh, you know part that we look at uh, with respect to that is growth into our future infrastructure commitments so we do see those commitments growing over the next three years up to 70,000 BOE per day. Um, in a $50 world, you asked about when we get on the front foot again. In a $50 world, next year's uh, cash flow improves 60%, um, generating $75 million of free cash over and above our maintenance levels. So at that point, you know, with those infrastructure commitments growing at about 10% per year, um, we will be able to allocate the ca capital back into the growth to ma match that 10% also being able to allocate capital back into the balance sheet. And that's one of the defining factors, I think, for New Vista is that amount of torque to a recovery in oil price just changes the trajectory of the company and changes the ability to get back to work on the balance sheet. And then the third part of it is that the, the incremental dollars that we're investing in that growth have to generate best in class returns and from an IRR perspective. And so we look at it at $40 oil, if we're drilling wells, those wells need to be generating 50 plus percent uh, full cycle rates of return. And for, it also is important to keep in mind for us that all the infrastructure is built out. So a lot of those things that really weigh on your first full cycle returns on, on the incremental invested capital are behind us. And uh, again, so it's just that incremental you know, 30 to $50 million of growth capital is just, just about wells. Um, I think, you know, you, we talked a little bit about the declines, but that's again, one of the things that we, we really think is a defining factor for New Vista that we flattened our production into um, uh, through the back half of 2020. We're paying 50 to $55 million of, of debt before the end of the year. And then a very um, uh, modest base decline at 30% next year gives us the flexibility to withstand the downside, but then also to quickly get on the, on the front foot in a recovery up to $50 oil next year. Paul, well, obviously this question is going to be a little bit different for you. Um, you know, clearly you've got a bit more of a growth mandate in the next few years. Uh, you hinted at a few longer term numbers. Uh, can you maybe touch on, Paul, when you get to those, you know, what's the target number where you think you can start generating free cash or returns to shareholders or et cetera, et cetera? Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're somewhat different. Um, the way we see our, our next or three-year business plan right now, JJ, is that um, we're going to outspend cash flow this year and next year in 21, uh, but we're virtually cash flow neutral in our growth plan in 22. So uh, during that, the next two years, we see delevering from, you know, based on our, our low cash flow this year, based on, you know, the, the, the price shock we've hit. Um, we're going to exit this year at four and a half times net debt to cash flow in our plan. And we're going to delever naturally to 1.3 at the end of 2022. So to, to, to us, uh, a bulletproof debt balance sheet is absolutely critical. Um, so coming out of 22, our board and our management team is going to be in an interesting position because we will be uh, looking forward at a, at a pretty significant free cash flow stream, uh, relatively bulletproof uh, uh, balance sheet and, and the options to uh, continue to phase two of a growth plan or moderate that and, and start uh, thinking about uh, distributions. I, the, it, trust me, distributions are not part of our actual plan today. Um, bulletproofing our balance sheet is, is certainly more important to us. Um, we are, however, though, hedging actively into this plan. So you'll see us, we're probably... 25% hedged on 21 oil volumes today and, you know, 35 to 40% hedged on our gas volumes. So, and as I said earlier at strip today, we're, we're quite excited about, about our, uh, about our options to, to keep going. So that's, that's probably in a nutshell, what, what our, what's in our head as far as, um, you know, as our future or three year business outlook. I think that's about all the time we have. Um, I'll summarize very quickly, 
the biggest takeaways, at least from my perspective. Uh, clearly, the resource is material, no matter how big or small the company, whether you're uh, you know, a growing uh, junior producer like Pipestone or a larger like Seven Gens. Uh, the resource is material, and we're very conservative in the way we develop it, which is not to fool anybody that's, you know, that's uh, watching this, uh, to think that, you know, we're not growing because we can't grow. We're not growing because we think this is the best returns, you know, focusing on returns and managing our decline is probably the best uh, use of creating long-term shareholder values. So that's point number one. Two, uh, focused on free cash uh, since before, as, as Marty said, since before it was cool. Uh, so certainly we have a leg up there. Environmental standards are, are extremely high, and the more and more motney production that comes on stream, we believe, you know, whether it's through facilitating LNG facilities uh, uh, or replacing coal plants, et cetera, you know, we think we have an advantage from that front. And then lastly, and it, you know, I kind of did this in first order, but you know, from a supply demand perspective, uh, fundamentals are actually very attractive, both for condensate demand, as, as you know, most you know, most producers on this panel generate a significant amount of their revenue from condensate. Uh, the condensate is, you know, we're short condensate in the basin you know, to fuel, uh, you know, mixing into Dilbit for the oil sands. So that's positive. And on the ACO front, uh, certainly all the pipeline deep bottlenecks that are taking place that have hindered us in the past, in the, in the last couple of days, uh, the last couple of years, excuse me, are being resolved. And we're certainly seeing that in ACO strength uh, today relative to the nine minutes benchmark. So, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, thank you for your time, Intercom. Thank you for hosting us and allowing us to tell our story. Hopefully we piqued everybody's interest and uh, we'd like you to join us uh, in the individual company panels uh, that are taking place later on. Thank you, JJ, for moderating the Montney panel and thank you to all the participants that were part of it. Thank you to all our presenters today, our sponsors and attendees. This concludes our first day and we will see you here tomorrow.